that I know to cut all the video before this. Okay, cool. So thank you for joining us talking about the Neolithic Revolution. Um, and just as a reminder, these lessons are based on world history classes and world history textbooks and curriculum that are for students between the ages of about 14 and 17 years old. However, they're not purely based on the textbook and we'll talk about a lot more. And of course you guys can ask questions and I do not mind going off on tangents. Um, can everybody hear me okay? So my head is not the best. I should have asked this earlier. Um, my head is not the best because of uh, migraine issues. So talking loudly is not, not the best for me. I should have asked that earlier. Um, I am gonna switch out my glasses actually already. Already getting there. So for those of you that do not have migraines, um, everything triggers a migraine. So that includes light, too much sound, too much smell and so on. So yes, viva la revolucion. All right. Yeah, I was surprised Sugar. We actually checked Cairo just to see what time it would be. So welcome. Thank you for joining us. So the time period that we're talking about is between 8,000 BCE and 4,000 BCE. Neolithic literally means new stone age, right? What does that mean? What was the old stone age versus the new stone age? Why do we even call it that? You know, these are the things that I had wondered maybe as a student and just keep, I, I was the student that kept asking 8,000 questions in class. Um, to the point that it was annoying for the teacher. As a teacher, having those students, I think, is awesome. And unfortunately, though, we may not have enough time to cover certain things. So I start writing their questions on the board if it gets a little too down one of these rabbit holes. Um, so that way we can finish the lesson and then go back to their questions and address them. Um, hello, Mr. Puck. I do not read Japanese. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, so why would we call it New Stone Age versus Old Stone Age? I will let you guys answer that. Also, summary, yes, we have coffee and we have tea. These are my more favorite cups. This is a, a space cup that I've had pretty much since I've come to Korea. And this is for a Korean... Um, franchise for coffee called Latte King and they actually didn't have any of these large large ones anymore this was their display and after asking them uh over a few weeks hey when are you, are you gonna get the big cups I just said can I just buy this cup and they said yeah sure <laughs> so I got the big cup was there an era before for stone tools made from flint before they started fashioning more sophisticated tools from treated stone yes and we also want to think about the purpose of that okay so one of the big things you want to remember for this is that the old stone age is stone tools for hunting and gathering type of stuff the neolithic age the new stone tools we're going to have for things like farming as well so that's going to be the big difference and for anyone who wasn't sure what a revolution is it's a very big change um the way i like to tell my students is that evolution is a small change over a big period of time revolution is a big change over a small period of time now some people might say well what about protests um what about the russian revolution isn't that a type of revolution too well yes and that's a very big political change in a short period of time so what's going on with the neolithic revolution what's that change we're having so all of the hominids were hunter gatherers not just we homo sapiens but of course every other hominid that we've ever uh, ever found evidence for. So they were all hunter-gatherers having a good time. I will say, if you're gonna go hunting, this is the kind of thing that you want to blend in, okay? Um, I remember when I was in the Marines and we were just doing some, you know, training stuff, uh, some of us had started putting leaves and things to camouflage ourselves better. And I just remember, um, you know, they were like, okay, when have you ever seen a moving tree? And so we were just like, oh yeah, maybe, maybe sticks and stuff is not the best. Because you'll see that. You'll see something that's moving that shouldn't be moving, right? So dressing up like this might be a little bit better if you guys are ever going to go hunting, okay? Um, and the gatherers, of course, 
are hanging out, doing their thing, right, at the camp. I do want to make this thing. So you guys can't see it, but I have a separate window that's open that has your comments in it. And I'm going to go ahead and just adjust this for a second. Uh, it's odd. History was my worst subject. And so, sorry. Let's go back more. Wait, was this the time when ancient people started building monolithic structures? So those big stone structures, yes. That's the Neolithic period when we were building the monolithic stuff. However, when we talked about Gobeleke Tepe before, for those of you that were not with us, uh, we will check that. And here's that time in Cairo there for you, Shugal. Um, Gobeleke, there we go. Not goblins, what? No. Gobeleke. I misspelled it, I think. Here we go. So these are monoliths. These are just like these large things made out of a single stone in a lot of cases. Um, but these seem to predate civilization. And we'll talk about civilization in this uh, in this video. Um, so Gobeleke Tepe appears to be some type of calendar and or religious center, but it predates um, civilization, which is a really big, big thing. Um, let's see, I suppose it was good afternoon, but I suppose good morning is more appropriate for your time zone. I, I think, I don't know, it's 11, you know. Um, history, or history was my worst subject in school, now I wish I paid attention, which is, you know, part of the reason I'm doing this. I think a lot of students really did not like history. I hated history in school too. I'm kind of surprised they teach it, uh, just because, you know, me from, like, my teenage years would never have anticipated that I would be doing this. Um, I love it, and I think that was the issue, is that I loved learning about history outside of school. So I try to bring a lot of that to the class. I just imagine Lee wearing antlers with a bearskin frock. I feel like I feel like students would pay a lot more attention if I showed up with like these weird antlers on my head. <laughs> so when we do talk about the hunter-gatherers, I know we tend to think of, you know, these, these big, strong, early humans running after mammoths for a long, long period of time, and, and that's great. That's not where the majority of our food came from, though. Going on those super long hunts for those big game items, that takes a lot of energy, which is our calories. So that's really great, and the reward is really great, too, but we need to have all these extra calories to carry along with us or to forage along the way as we're hunting down this mammoth. Uh, the way that we hunted down mammoths, as far as we know, is either to chase them off of cliffs, and then they just die at the end, um, or to chase them for long periods of time until the mammoth got so tired that it just would lay down and it just can't run away anymore and we just stab it to death, okay? Uh, humans are basically like zombies, you know, we have the ability to sweat. Other mammals tend to not have that ability. So as we're running, we can cool off. Other animals will start to overheat and so they need to take these breaks and then just imagine being that mammoth. You see these weird little things coming at you. So you kind of run away. You look back. Don't really see them. Take a break. Here's something at the horizon. Look over. And you see these hunters <laughs> coming at you, right? So you get back up. You start running again. You start slowing down. <sighs> look back. What do, what do, what's that over there? These hunters coming along again. Um, this would have been like being chased by zombies. You know, you would wonder where do they get all this energy from? How are they still following me? It doesn't matter how far I run. They're still able to find me. You don't understand that they're following your tracks, but that's what they're doing. And they would just seem like the scariest, you know, supernatural kind of thing coming at you. Um, let's see. History is one of those subjects that, while important to learn, is much easier to learn when it's a personal motivation rather than an obligation. I would say so. I would definitely say so. But I also think the way that it's taught matters. Um, I want the students, first of all, to understand things. Like I didn't say, hey, we're starting with the Neolithic Revolution and then jump into slide four. I want you guys to understand not only when it is, but what, why we even call it Neolithic. What is a revolution? How do we define that? Um, those types of things are going to help people remember it. We, we have this idea of hunter-gatherers. We know what the old Stone Age was like. We can start imagining what other things we could use to farm? How could I use stone tools for that? So that's a new use. It's a new stone age. Um, for the most part, I don't have my students memorize dates and names because that's what I had to do. And I thought that doesn't really help. Um, I try to get them to memorize concepts. Um, so that's the big deal. 
Um, I like that approach is less, focus less on learning dates. Yes, exactly, exactly what I said there, Summer. Um, notice we just kind of mentioned, you know, it is 8,000 BCE to 4,000 BCE, but I really started to explain what is Neolithic, what is revolution. So if you don't remember the dates exactly, you can at least remember, oh, this came after the hunter-gatherer time period. Um, again, speaking of hunter-gatherers, remember the big deal is the gatherers. The gatherers are going to provide the vast majority of your calories. It's just much, much easier to collect food than it is to hunt for food. Um, things that can be gathered, of course, are you know different kinds of grasses and roots, um, fruits, nuts, and eggs. So those are some of the things that we would be gathering. Okay, so of course, this means that if you can find something or kill something, then you get to eat it, which also means if you can't find something or kill something, you don't get to eat that day. You'd be very lucky if you had any extra stuff, but remember, you can't really stockpile things. Why can't we really stockpile things? I mean, wouldn't that make sense to just get a bunch of meat or a bunch of dried apples or something and just stockpile it? Wouldn't that just make sense? So while I'm letting you guys answer that, I'm going to check out your questions or comments. I once read someone say that humans are the slasher villains of the animal kingdom. We don't just, we don't have to outrun our prey. We just need to keep following it until it exhausts itself. Exactly. Um, some argue that certain species of primates living now are entering the Stone Age. Chimps and orangutans have started using tools. Um, to be fair, we, we've known that other hominids have used tools um, for a long, long time. So like Homo erectus, for example, used tools and had an understanding of how to use fire. So that was really cool. Um, so to, I wouldn't even say that we would argue that certain species of primates are entering the Stone Age. They are in the Stone Age and they have been in the Stone Age for quite a long time. Um, depending on, you know, where they live, I, you know, like the chimps that are brought into captivity, um, they're even able to use uh, like touchscreen technology. So it's, I wonder if we could teach them farming. Um, there are other primates that do understand long-term stuff. So for example, they will take, um, it's a type of, I think it's a stone fruit. Um, I think it's in South America. Please, please don't quote me on that. But the concept here is they will pick it from the tree and then they have to let it sit for like one to three weeks for it to ripen properly. And then they have to take another tool and smash it open. So not only do they need to know the tool to use to get it open, but they also know they have to wait for it after picking. So they have these planning abilities and stuff. Um, the animal kingdom is really, really awesome. Not just, you know, from from a humans only kind of standpoint. Uh, it's not avocado, no. It's, um, I don't remember what it is. It's, it's a type of, I don't remember why they have to wait, but it's, it's a weird kind of fruit. It has a casing kind of like an avocado. Um, but when I was watching it, I was thinking more like a, like a type of peach. That's why I kept saying stone fruit. Um, in terms of things to store, nuts would be very appropriate to gather because we need a source of fat. Absolutely, that's that's absolutely true. Um, unfortunately, gathering nuts takes a while, and to process them also takes a while. But by that I mean to take them out of their um, their shell, so that way you're able to carry things. For example, if we're thinking walnuts, um, it's a lot easier to carry a handful of shelled walnuts than it is a handful of unshelled walnuts, right? So that's the that's part of the problem is we want to be careful of that. Um, and then there's weird things like cashews where you have to you have to choose between the fruit of the cashew or the nut of the cashew because based on how you process it. Um, but the big deal with us for finding and storing things is that remember we're kind of moving around. We are nomadic or at least semi-nomadic. You can't really stockpile a bunch of stuff because you gotta carry it. And that's the big issue. It just kind of made more sense to move lightly with the animals or with the changing of seasons than it did to kind of start stockpiling stuff. Because remember, if I know that I have a tr uh, route that I have to travel throughout the year, for example, but I decide to stay a little later in the summer because I collected a bunch of stuff and now I can just kind of hang out, 
if I'm here in the summer, but I need to be way over here in the winter, I don't know if you guys can see that, I can't see my camera. Um, if you guys are way over here in the winter, and maybe on a certain date you need to start walking this way to make it to this section of the winter, if instead you spent an extra two, three, four weeks because you had collected so much stuff and it was too difficult to move, you were just kind of living off of your um, dried supply, now you are a month behind trying to get where you need to go. So this would interfere with your ability to get there on time. You might be snowed out. It could turn into like a Donner Party sort of thing, if you guys are familiar with the Donner Party. Um, if you're not familiar with the Donner Party, basically they had uh, set out a little bit too late uh, because they had assumed they were going to cut time off with a certain pass uh, or a certain trail. That didn't happen. Um, so they ended up getting stuck in the snow and had to unfortunately eat each other. This may have been the time where wheat was GMO'd by people uh, to corn and maize in the North American continent. Yes, so we will talk about North America a little bit later and South America a little bit later as well and talk about like the evolution a bit of corn. But corn is pretty interesting if you guys are not able to watch it then. Um, what am I looking for? Evolution of corn. So we have this really interesting kind of thing. So corn is basically a glorified grass is really what it is. I don't know if I would necessarily classify it as a vegetable because it's it's grass. So that's kind of where we are with that. It's kind of cool. All right. So the real revolution that we're going to have is this agricultural revolution for us to finally figure out how to harness wheat. Okay, wheat is going to be the first thing that we had um, planted successfully. And that means one of two things were the first recipe. We're not actually sure if our first recipe was bread or if it was beer. So it's kind of an interesting concept. Beer has been with us as long as agriculture has been with us. Uh, why did some Stone Age people migrate so far north where it's hard to survive? That is a, a, also a great question. So if you are living in an area, um, just to kind of briefly cover that, and if we can get our good map of Ice Age. Asia? Is this what we want to do? Nope, that's not it. No. I say it's just do North America. I just want that Bering Strait in there. It's not giving it to us. Maybe here. Great. Cool. So if we are, let's pretend we're over here where my mouse is moving, assuming that this is on the map in Russia and not on these like images I'm accidentally touching. As things are getting colder, it's not very easy to pull stuff out of the ground, right? It's just very difficult to become a gatherer. And so now you have a choice. Go more south and become a gatherer or, hey, we saw a pack of mammoths going that way. Well, I know if we kill mammoths, we'll have a lot to eat. Uh, we're going to get our protein and fat, plus tools, clothing, a lot of stuff out of that. So that becomes your choice. Go south and hope that we can find stuff. Remember, some of the stuff in um, southern Europe is very, very, it's, a, it's called a, like a Mediterranean biome. Um, this Mediterranean biome, just to kind of show you... Uh, this chaparral biome looks like this, okay? Uh, when I tell my students for geography, and we will do a geography section as well, um, I call it a crunchy desert, okay? It's a desert with a lot of crunch, all right? This is not an area where a lot of stuff grows. So you can kind of go south and maybe encounter this, or you already know this is there, or you can follow these mammoths. And, well, I know if I catch them, it's food and clothing and tools. I'm gonna take that chance. Now, maybe not everybody will. We might have a, a, like a larger tribe split off. Um, we might meet up with a tribe that's already following them and say, hey, can we join you guys? Because this like, looks, looks like the bet that I wanna make um, is by following these guys. And that's just kind of how it happened. These mammoths ended up going across the Bering Strait region here uh, which these days, it is underwater, uh, but during the Ice Age, not only was there a glacier there, but there was just more of the water was in the glaciers, um, so there was more land that was just exposed um, 
just around the coast. And so now these, and these mammoths, they're not going to North America. They're just going away from these weird things that are chasing them. And it just ended up in North America. Um, so that's kind of how we got there. Um, it's sort of an interesting kind of concept. Um, what about you guys? What would you do? Would you take a chance with the mammoths and follow them in the cold? But you know that even though the weather sucks, at least this is a viable source of food. This is like, remember, we're not following a mammoth. We're following a big old herd of mammoths. Or would you say, you know what? I'm much more comfortable in this warmer area. I'd rather take my chance, you know, trying to find smaller animals and supplement that with like roots, nuts, berries, and that kind of thing. What would you guys do while you guys are doing that? Um, let's see. Mr. Puck asked, bread or beer? Why not both? It is both. I'm just saying which one was first. The first one couldn't be both, right? There's only one of them. Um, but it seems beer could have been because beer can be made accidentally. If I had collected some wheat and let it sit, it could accidentally be made under certain conditions. Um, so we would be able to figure out beer before we would figure out bread so much. Um, I've lived in southern Spain and it's almost desert. Yes, exactly. People move to stay away from other crazy people. Also true. Um, I'll stick with the deer. Remember, you're not getting deer, okay? Not when you're going to this kind of biome. You're getting like ferrets. Um, you're getting scorpions. Remember, we're eating bugs, okay? Even today, 80% of the planet still eats bugs. Fantastic source of protein, very you know low environmental impact and all of that. Um, so you're not hanging out finding a bunch of deer here, okay? That's that's why it's a chance, okay? You're you're either scratching by a living in a nicer climate, or you are getting these big ticket items, which are the mammoths, but in a much harsher climate. So that's kind of your choice here. So I uh, just kind of you know what type of person I'll try to tame the mammoths, okay? I don't think they're quite quite at that point um, wanting to attempt to tame a mammoth. I think that would be a bit difficult. <laughs> I would personally head south. I live in the Arctic and can't remember, I can't imagine surviving here with Stone Age tech. Right, it's, <sighs> can you just, I mean, either way, you're gonna have a hard time. This was not an easy life for anybody by any means, you know. Um, so this is what scientists call the Great Migration out of Africa. So this is after, yes. So this is um, out of the out of Africa theory is about human evolution, um, Homo sapien evolution in Africa, and then out then spreading out from there, as opposed to human ancestors like hominids in different parts that spread out of Africa and from there evolved into Homo sapiens. Okay, so that's that's what the out of Africa theory just talks about. So here's Africa, right? All of our evolution happened here, and cool, we started spreading out as Homo sapiens, not other hominids, Homo sapiens specifically. After that time period, that's when we're getting these pushes into other um, climates, right? So that's what we're doing. Um, also, by the way, at that time period, um, the Sahara, really gorgeous and green. So unfortunately now it's a big old desert, but it's actually really gorgeous and green back during that whole human evolution time period. I'm willing to guess there are more dead skeleton bones in those colder, more arid climates than there are colder climates with the mammoths. Um, yes, I would say so, just because I think more people would have hung out there. You know what I mean? Um, I'm also trying to just think you know, if I see something die and I live in this warmer climate, I may bury the person, but if I'm out in, you know, the Arctic Circle during the Ice Age and one of our buddies dies, we're probably going to eat him. And actually about 20%, uh, you guys know why you shouldn't eat people other than it's a social taboo? You guys know why that you shouldn't eat people, by the way, just out of curiosity? Uh, while you guys are answering that, I will look at your questions. A bit unrelated, but I totally be down for cloning mammoths to farm and eat. Um, that's gonna be that big environmental impact that we kind of mentioned. Bugs will be better for farming and eating for sure. Uh, more po people probably chose the better climate because it was a better choice. And prions, yes, prions. So you wanna avoid eating human brains and human spinal fluids, right? You can actually 
Apparently, eat like some of the muscle, but you just want to avoid that brain stuff. Okay. So if you're ever in a situation where this has to happen, um, a reason not to eat people the taste, no sugar, we apparently taste like sweet pork. Actually, our bodies are very similar to, to pigs, so it's, it's quite interesting that we also taste very similar to pigs. Um, but yes, prions, especially in the brain. However, about 20% of the population has an immunity to that. So it does point to successful cannibalism in our past. It's kind of an interesting kind of idea. Um, and so that would be the other reason, I think, uh, just what I was saying with David's uh, comment, that's another reason I think it would be easier to find bones in these dry, warm regions as opposed to these cold regions. Because if my buddy's dying and we're in the Arctic Circle, I'm eating him. And I don't, I'm not just eating him. I'm breaking his bones apart. I'm eating his marrow. I'm using his bones as tools, that kind of thing. So his bones are going to be a lot... If we find them, there are fragments. Do you know what I mean? We're not going to find these whole skeletons necessarily. It'll be a rare find for sure. If we start, if we're in a crisis situation and they start looking at you, know that you're on the menu. I feel like I would wait until somebody died. Do you know what I mean? I, don't, I wouldn't just kill you to eat you. I would just kind of wait. Whoever dies, I think that's the fairest way to do it. Whoever dies first, we eat you. You know, don't, don't, don't draw straws or something. Just the person who dies first gets eaten. Um, so that's, that's how I would do it. <laughs> All right. So of course, agriculture um, that means we're controlling our food, okay? And when we're talking about agriculture, we're talking about plants and we're talking about animals. So this would be an example of animal agriculture. I really like this picture. It just makes me feel very, I don't know, relaxed. You know what I mean? Just relaxed. Okay. Uh, this is from the book, uh, The Systematic, or Spread of Systematic Agriculture. Um, so before 5000 BCE, uh, we're going to get this dark orange kind of region here. This is going to be, of course, in, around the Nile River and also in the Fertile Crescent, a.k.a. Mesopotamia region. Okay. Um, and then later is going to come this purple region. And then after that, we're going to get the yellow region. Now, if you do notice, some of the purple regions are over here in South Asia, East Asia, over here in South America, and also Southern North America. Okay. So these are areas that were, um, they had agriculture and that was uh, before, between 5000 and 2000 BCE. So it's kind of exciting here. And there's also this yellow, I don't know how well you can see it, um, but it's so fun. Like I love looking at a lot of this stuff because you can just see these early civilizations start right around a, uh, like a, a river so I sometimes I show the students like population maps and you can just see the river because of the population I really like I really like maps okay like maps <laughs> so these big big crops that we're gonna get are wheat and barley over in the western area in the eastern area it's rice does anybody know why why are we getting rice versus wheat and barley how come I'm not growing wheat and rice together so while you guys are answering that, I'm going to check this out. Um, do you think there could have been advanced civilizations of humans before the Stone Age? Um, not based on any of our, uh, not based on any of our technology or any of our uh, findings um, in archaeology. I mean, hypothetically, could it have happened? Sure. But these would be people that need to, they would be harnessing metals, I would assume. Um, and we would definitely have found stuff, right? Um, so we haven't found their stuff. We found old stuff, older than humans. You know, we're finding hominids, right, before Homo sapiens. So we're still able to find all this really old stuff, and yet we don't really find any of these um, advanced archaeological uh, artifacts. So that's, that's, uh, that's why I would say it's very unlikely. Um, but could it have been possible, just as a hypothetical? Sure, could have been possible. Um, let's see. Looks interesting. I wonder if the French took notes from this revolution. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about, which part that we're talking about, taking notes from this revolution. However, I do really like your username, Microsoft Word Technical Support. <laughs> uh, let's see. 
Did Neolithic people have ranged weapons to hunt animals? Uh, yes. The Actually, the old Stone Age, that's when we started that. Even um, if you refer back to our, our first lesson, um, even the uh, Neanderthal had spears. They were not ranged weapons, but they were spears. Um, and one of the reasons Neanderthal was unable to compete as the climate was changing was because their spears were handheld and needed to be like to sneak up on the animal whereas uh the homo sapiens were able to have ranged weapons um so that was a, a different kind of thing um let's see rice is due to wetter climates and humidity and puddles with rice patties in the east there's more fresh water can't grow rice can't you grow rice in super wet places yes 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 okay um if you have a lot you need to grow rice in standing water if you have a bunch of standing water wheat will just not grow okay so that's pretty much the big difference um you know being in east asia some of my students had asked why do western people eat so much bread and i was just like it's the climate that's that's all there is to it and so that was the question for the students as well and so over here on the left we can see um some wheat that's growing and over here on the the right uh, we can see rice growing. These are rice wheat fields and rice paddies is how we want to say that. Sorry, it's a bad joke. Ignore that. No, I want to, I mean, I'm good with bad jokes. I just didn't know specifically which it was referring to. Old rice grows in dry farms. Um, that I'm not 100% sure of. Um, I don't, uh, you know, I'm not the biology teacher, right? Uh, so I do understand enough biology for history teaching but if you want to share more about that um that would be that would be great for sure um are you talking like the pre like the the old rice like the starter rice sort of like we talked about the starter corn uh because that would be interesting um might want to find pre-modern we've changed a ton over 200 years i definitely believe that um we can check out pre-modern rice why not let's check it out let's see I mean, I know we've got the different colors of rice. We are unable to check this out. So that's something that I will have to do separately because I think we're going to have to get into it and do a lot of reading as opposed to just checking out pictures. Um, but yeah, we'll definitely, definitely check that out. Um, I am aware there were many species of rice. Um, the same with many species of corn as well. Um, and we do want to keep those species because the monoculture... Uh, thing is great for growing in a region unless that area uh, is blighted or has some kind of uh, fungus or other kind of uh, virus so that's why we want to make sure we still keep that um, diversity alive if we can so a lot of these changes that we're talking about are happening in west asia east africa and through south and southeast asia and i do want to emphasize that we are calling it west asia and not the middle east uh why would we do that why would we call it west asia does anybody know? I mean, I hope you guys know, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. As I know some people here, um, English is not their first language. So I just wanna make sure that uh, nothing I'm doing is, is too tricky. Do we have any? ideas here. Middle East is a political designation, okay? Bokasal is a rice that does not need to be cooked, okay? Very cool. Any, any others? So the Middle East, um, the reason that it was called that is just because it's east of Europe. East of Europe and east of eastern uh, North America. So that's why it's called that. Um, but over here where, you know, I'm at, um, in Eastern Asia, it's to the west of us, right? It's not the Middle East. Um, and then, of course, Eastern Asia used to be called the Far East or the Orient. And that word is Spanish uh, for, like, Oriental. It's, like, in the East, okay? Um, right, so when we use expressions like East, West, it's relative to who's speaking. Exactly. So when we're talking about West Asia, it's just the continent of Asia, the Western side of it. So this is much more of a neutral um, kind of way to state it. And that's why I want to use that. So what's really important? Number one, we don't have to worry about our food. We can grow it and we can keep it. 
Okay, now I'm storing my food. I don't really have to worry about moving. The farm is gonna be the one providing me all of this food year round. And we can do stuff, other stuff. This is a jug from ancient Israel called the thinking man jug. I think it's kind of cool. So that would mean that here at the top, there's a hole and then there's a hole that kind of goes down. I think this is a cool concept for a jug, right? I think it's really cool. Let's see, uh, West Asia or Middle East is a distinction made by Europeans to separate themselves from the Ottomans. Um, yes, and so again, we want to also remember that it is a European point of view, right? But not everybody's in Europe, so I just, we're wanting to talk about it as West Asia. So I like this jug. I think it's a cool looking jug. So what else are we doing? People are starting to doing things that they like for things that they needed to want to make, you know, baskets, clothes and shoes. I really like these clothes. I wish they would come back into style. I mean, even if they're not in style, I'd probably wear them. <laughs> Other people start learning how to make buildings really well with the available materials. And so the people that are specializing in these like handicrafts, um, these people are going to be called the artisans. And of course we need a place to live around this farm and that's where the first cities are going to be. Um, this is Jericho, it started about 8,000 BCE, which is 10,000 years ago. Um, just to make sure that there is some confusion when you look up Jericho. Um, it'll say it's 10,000 years old or it'll say 8,000 BCE. It's the same thing, uh, but for some reason um, some of the students were a bit confused by that. I just wanna make sure we're over here. So this is Jericho now here's an idea of what it could have looked like uh, based on what we understand of the archaeological findings. Um, I really think it's cool to have this giant wall. Of course, that would be a lot of resources, wouldn't it? Um, just from an urban planning perspective, it's you always want your most important stuff in either a middle or a junction point. Um, so here we're going to get um, the religious buildings, the government buildings, um, those are going to be in the middle. Also in the middle would be like a storage area, like a common storage area as well. So that's uh, what would be most important. Of course, the, the really, really excellently planned early city we'll talk about later, which is Mohenjo-Daro, which you may have heard of from ancient aliens. Um, have you heard ne reconstructed uh, Neanderthal bone flute music? It's really haunting. Um, no, I haven't. I've heard... Uh, our reconstruction of Neanderthal sounds based on uh, the bones that we found, but not from the bone flute music. Um, that's something maybe you can put, well you can't put a link. You can put a link in the, the Discord and that would be really cool so other people could hear it as well. Unfortunately, if I play a video on a live stream, um, YouTube flags it as like you're stealing other stuff or copyright material, so unfortunately I'm not able to play those. Um, this is another place called Sarohoyuk. Um, probably mispronouncing that. If anybody knows any Turkish-ish pronunciations, then please let me know. Uh, but this is about 500 years later. This was an interesting thing that people found in a lot of the homes. Does anybody have any ideas of what this could have been used for? So this was found in a lot of the homes in the, like, the main room. Any ideas? What this could be used for. Our word for downtown or city center is actually the same word for the middle uh, or land or, or encampment. Oh, that's very cool. That's very cool. Interestingly, the downtown part for the city center, usually the the old places like this is, uh, they were uptown. So it's like an upper city. Uh, we actually saw that in the reconstruction um, image. And then we'll see that again when we talk about Mahendradara later. Is that a threshing place for rice, a fire pit, a bathing area? These are all really good guesses. Any other guesses for that? Bathroom or a kitchen, a living room with spiky chairs, or a bedroom. So we probably are not going to have a bathroom right here just because it's in the middle of our, our house, right? It's like the middle sort of area. Um, this could be an area probably not for bathing with this mud probably that stuff is going to happen outside could be an area for wheats um there's no millstone but there could have been one in the past 
So another thing that this is likely to have been is a place to keep baby chickens or baby humans. Yes, there we are, kitty playpen, exactly. It's gonna be pretty difficult for little kids to get out. And the same thing is true with baby chicks. So that is probably what this area was for. Um, it also could have been used as a place to, um, to do any kind of wheat threshing, but something like this is just the height of it um, and the size of it. You probably, like an adult person being here would take up maybe half of this space. Like if you're sitting down on your butt, um, you would take up about half of that space here. So it's not exactly a good place to do any work, um, but it is a great place for little kids um, to be while I'm doing something in the other part of the house. That way I know that they're not gonna run out the door. So it's pretty, pretty cool that they had that. And again, you can use it for baby chicks. So it's kind of fun. So our society changes and we now have this thing called a civilization. So what is a civilization? You need a city, okay. This is Ur, which is one of the city states in Mesopotamia. Uh, we talked about Jericho, 8,000 BCE. So hey, we're off to a good start, right? We got a city, good times. We got our ziggurat hanging out back here. Okay, Ziggurat we'll talk about a little bit later. So the first civilization was Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is not a, it's like a region of city-states. Okay, so we're not going to think like the nation necessarily of Mesopotamia. Um, you can see it's between the Tigris and Euphrates. Those are some rivers and Mesopotamia means between the two rivers. Those are the two rivers. I'm sure many of you have heard of the Tigris and the Euphrates River before. Um, these are famous rivers. And I think there was this idea that the biblical Garden of Eden was off near one of these. So it's kind of cool. Um, as we said, Mesopotamia is between two rivers. And we have this thing called the Fertile Crescent. Okay. So usually I will draw something on a board, but I don't have a board. Can you see it if I do it here? Let me move this to see if, okay, great. I think you guys can see it. All right. So we have, you know, circle, star shape, crescent shape, right? Oops, so you can't really see it, can you? There we go. Ah, crescent shape. Okay. If we look at it, that's sort of what this Mesopotamia region looks like. Okay. It's a funky crescent. All right. And I think that's also where crescent comes from because it's like a crescent shape. Um, you know, we have names for stuff that we eat that is shaped like like a ball or a circle. Um, in Korean, there's, uh, you guys know kimbap probably. probably. Um, it is not Korean sushi. <laughs> um, so this is kimbap. And so there's another one called sangak kimbap, which means triangle kimbap. Um, so we can actually check it out here. Not triangle, we want triangle, okay. So this is another kind of thing. Um, so yeah, when you hear like croissant and it's kind of shaped like a crescent, did they name it after that? Is that what it means? Why would you call your food after a shape? Well, you know, other people do it too. So it's not just this thing that's funky in that, uh, in that language. Let's see what you guys have written. Let's see. Uh, what was the slot in the wall for? Yeah, let's check out the slot in the wall. I was wondering if anyone was going to mention that. So the slot in the wall could be um, like an air hole. It could be a little um, space for something, uh, maybe for a kid to put something. Um, these little <clears throat> recesses in the wall um, would work a lot of times just like we have it as a shelf, but usually for like a god or goddess figurine. So something like that would be there. So if I had my little kids here, um, remember the little kid is going to basically be like this height at this point here, okay? So this slot is actually going to be a little bit higher than the kid can reach. And it's probably going to be something like a goddess that protects children. I would put something like that there. Um, or a god of, of um, what am I thinking, of agriculture, if I have my chicks there, my little baby chickens. Um, so something like that could, could function as it. Um, I will say that there was running water in some of these ancient civilizations, just not as... Yeah, not maybe as far as back as this, but we do get running water later on. So it's actually kind of cool. Um, 
Let's see, Kim Muff is bibimbap wrapped with seaweed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love Korean bean cookies. They are so sweet and rich in flavor. They definitely, definitely are. Um, let's see. Cool, remove the children before using it for wheat threshing. Yes. The only issue with wheat threshing that I would, would see is just if I'm sitting down and I take up half of this space, I'm not sure how, how well or comfortably I can thresh wheat. Um, open fire pit cooking, probably not indoors. Okay. We're probably going to do that maybe outside. Um, we want to make sure we, you know, outdoor kitchens are more common than indoor kitchens. When we're talking about ancient places, actually my grandparents, um, they had a, an outdoor kitchen. Um, my parents had an outdoor kitchen. So my grandparents owned it. My parents had to deal with it. Um, so it's an outdoor kitchen just because of the smoke situation. Of course, if you live in an area that gets quite cold, yes, you want to have an indoor um, part of your kitchen. But for an area like uh, Mesopotamia, we're not going to get a ton of snowfall. Of course, you do get some snowfall, like in the mountains of Lebanon, for example. But for the average person living near the, uh, these rivers, we're not going to have like a ton of snowfall that's going to interfere with cooking at night or cooking in the winter. Um, Let's see, you can stuff the misbehaving children in there, exactly. Stick their little button there, and they're just going to be stuck in the wall, exactly. Uh, looks like the lower half of a face, okay. Little The way that little baby Ugg Ugg has something to play with, absolutely. All right, I'm glad you guys are really getting into, like, this, you know, uh, having this idea of this is... Uh, like, putting yourself in that situation, you know, like, if you were in there seeing these kids... Um, that's that's really good to do that. Um, so the first thing we need, of course, again, is the city. Next, we need a government. So once we have a city, the government is pretty much going to be coming up next. Most likely, we had a monarchy. So it's a king or queen that's in power. Um, this is an example of a type of monarchy. It's not necessarily what everyone is going to have. Uh, for example, the nobles and the priests and the government officials might be in different areas. Um, in this case, the government officials would also include soldiers. So that's one thing to remember. Religion! That also shows up quite early. Um, again, we may have had religion before civilization. We just aren't going to have a lot of artifacts from it. It's pretty hard to carry a church with you, right? It's very hard to carry books with you when you don't have a written language. Do you know what I mean? So this is not something that nomads even today tend to do. If they have something religious, it's usually about, like we talked about before, it's about this size. So this is something you might carry with you that has a religious significance. End of story. You're not going to make these big statues because you just can't take them with you. So this is the Goblake Tepe. Um, so there is some evidence of religion before the Neolithic Revolution. Um, but now we're getting it in like every significant um, city. And so now we have this new job called a priest. Okay. Um, how would you guys describe the word priest without using anything Catholic? How would you describe the word priest? Um, there's some snow in northern Iraq, at least at present day. Yes, so that's another thing to remember um, is present day as well. Um, but there is also snow that happens in the desert, too. Um, that's part of the precipitation that can happen in um, dry desert, or not dry deserts, that's redundant, um, hot deserts. Uh, the largest desert, of course, is Antarctica. Um, and it doesn't snow very much there either. Uh, but yes, that's uh, it's not enough that would necessarily deter me from keeping an outdoor kitchen. Um, and there are outdoor kitchens in places that are snowier. Um, it's just not as common. Slightly off topic, but get a global population density map and check out the region between Kokand and Anjian. Um, Westerners have never heard of the place, but it's like the it's like the density map in the Netherlands. Cool. I'm um, just curious if uh, how this is related. So just just curious. Let's see, priest, the guy who tells you how to behave and what happens to you in the afterlife, also tells you how prehistoric science works and science in quotations. Priest, an intermediary between the people and the gods or the spirit world, a leaden person who knows a bit about the nature. Priest is a designation referred to someone who carries out ceremonies, offers libations, gives blessings. Um, also might teach reading and writing to those who could afford it. A priest is a religious lawgiver. This is great because all of you are correct. Um, so these are all different ways to describe a priest. 
Um, the way that I kind of just sum it up for my students to remember it, it is a teacher in the religion. For whatever reason and whatever way that they're teaching, that's their job. Their job is to lead you somehow in the religion. Um, so it's a religious leader. A lot of them think that they can talk to the spirits or gods or that they can understand the spirits or gods. So even if you don't necessarily talk to them, if we have like my tea here and I left all the tea leaves in here, I could have someone drink it and then I can try to interpret what the tea leaves might mean because the gods communicated to me through the tea leaves. So it doesn't necessarily mean they speak to the gods verbally, um, but that they, they are in communication with them in some fashion. Um, drug use was actually a lot of the ways that this happened, and we'll talk about that too uh, later on in this book, okay? Um, early religions are polytheists. I'm sure most of you know what polytheism is. Um, I just thought this picture was cool, especially because this guy looks like Beast from X-Men. <laughs> so kind of, a, kind of a fun time. Let's see. So based on this, would Lee be our priestess? You know what, Shul? I actually tell the students that. I just let them know. Like, okay, so if I was teaching you, uh, talking to you guys about religion instead of talking to you guys about history, then I would be your priest and not your teacher. So just to give them an idea of what that word means. Um, in the Bronze Age, a king was a priest in many cultures. True. And also in some of them, um, he was either the leader of the religion or an actual god on earth and the priests would like enact his his word and that's kind of what they they did as well um and they would also be in charge of um just like offerings to other gods so when we think of like a god that's a leader we classically think of maybe you know the egyptian pharaohs for example um while they're god on earth there's also other gods so the priests are also um, giving offerings and stuff to those other gods. Prehistoric Avengers in that picture. Yeah, that's that's what I think. Um, let's see. I guess someone who intercedes with the public on behalf of the broader government and religious institutions in religious terms and language. Okay, that's another good example of what a priest or a way that we could try to describe a priest. That blue guy is looking pretty funky. Must be fertility god based on his girth. Yeah, I, these are, you know, if you guys want extra credit, you can, you can do that. I like Dagon. Dagon here reminds me of uh, E-Honda from <laughs> Street Fighter. Uh, let's see, Tammuz is Conan. Yeah, yeah, we're getting those kind of looks. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, yeah, thank you. Somebody mentioned uh, Spectre um, and then Nightcrawler as well. That's, that's really what I was thinking with these. Um, so I like to, you know, do as I did here, just kind of make a comment and then let the students carry on with it rather than explaining this is exactly what I see to them. So there was also this ziggurat building, which was made for the gods. And this is where you would make, um, you know, this is not like a church. It functions somewhat similarly, but it's also a place to like make announcements that are political. So, hey, we're all doing this thing, or all the taxes are going up, or whatever. Something like that would be made at the ziggurat. Um, the ziggurat was also a place to store grain. So all the excess storage would be here, which also means that in uh, times of famine, for example, or just fewer crops, um, you would go to the ziggurat to get like your, um, your daily rations, for example. So that's kind of cool. I really like the shape of the ziggurat. I think it looks cool. I like ziggurat. Okay. So as, you know, as I mentioned before, it's not just that religious place. It's also, it's a multi-purpose building, you know, pretty cool. We're also going to get this big social structure. Um, let's see, a fully covered goddess. Why not? Why not? Uh, some modern countries have priest monarchs. Yes. Um, there's also North Korea. It's technically a theocracy, right? Who's the leader? Who's the president of North Korea? Kim Il Sung. That's he's dead. He's the eternal president of North Korea. Even though he died, he's still technically the leader. So yeah, it's it's interesting. Well, wait. So government and administrative buildings were religious buildings. Um, I find that mind blowing. Not I, I. I don't want you to to think that they are necessarily that they are one and the same. It's just the building we can think of as more of like a multi-purpose building, 
So not only is it for government announcements, but it's for religious um, events, like on the holidays and those things. And it's also to store excess grain. So it's it's a multi-purpose building. That's one of the reasons it was in the middle. So it's it's not that the government was necessarily religious, although many of them were, of course. Um, it's that the ziggurat is this multifunctional building, which is pretty cool. Um, and it makes sense. It's in the middle of the city. This is where... Um, everybody knows where to go. These are where the big roads are going to lead to. It just kind of makes sense that all of the major stuff that we care about in early civilization is going to be here. So that's what the reason for the ziggurat being that way. Uh, wasn't Kim Il-sung a Christian? Uh, Kim Il-sung like, had, a, had a mythology about him, that he was a god born on uh, one of these famous mountains in Bektusan, uh, Mount Bektu. Uh, it's on the border of... China and North Korea, um, and that he came down, like he was born, what, of a, of a dove and a rainbow or something. So I, I definitely wouldn't say that that's Christian. He, he was, he created this, um, mythology about himself, that he wasn't even human. He is a god. Um, he cannot die. His body might die, but he never dies. Uh, that kind of thing. So it's, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, was the Tower of Babel a ziggurat? I... I would say, I mean, if I were to guess, I would say it was, but then that would also be a guess. Um, the Tower of Babel likely never existed, um, but if we're going to make a tower for the purpose of communicating with the gods, and just based on how high it would have to reach, um, knowing the shape of this, you can see this shape is something we can keep adding to, right? Um, so this, I mean, it, it could be a ziggurat. But, again, the purpose would be to contact God in the sky. I mean, why wouldn't it be a ziggurat, right? What else could it be? A minaret? <laughs> you know, which didn't exist at that time. Um, so, yeah. Uh, it was never finished. Yes, it was a Ziggy to Marduk. It was never finished. Um, so, the, the idea of what I'm saying about um, the Tower of Babel as the like the Christian Tower of Babel or the Judeo-Christian Tower of Babel, this idea that God struck it down on purpose and also confused everybody's languages. I'm saying that is, yeah, not likely to have happened. Um, Kim Il-sung shot 18 holes in one in a row, perfect 18, 18 holes of golf, of golf according to his mythology. Yeah, just the... Uh, yeah, I don't know why they're they're so focused on sport there. Um, I think what Kim Kim Jong Il said he invented basketball or something. Very very strange. Um, social structure. Of course, we're gonna have a social structure of a type with hunter gatherers. Mostly, like this is a this is your job. Um, but here we're thinking of people that are actually above others um, in the sense of social recognition and also in the sense of being able to acquire resources. So that's not something we would have necessarily had in uh, these hunter-gatherer type of uh, uh, cultures. So now, since we have a leader at the top, we have farmers below, we're also going to get this structure that kind of goes in uh, between these here. And this is a, an interesting um, sort of a rock wall. Um, this is part of a rock wall, but it's uh, like paying homage to this person. We can see here, this person here would be in a position of power, and these guys over here are not. It's also interesting that they're much, much shorter, and this guy over here actually looks very similar to one of my cousins, so I really like this picture. So these people now, they're going to want to show off that they have the ability to access excess resources. Um, and they can show that off with non-essential items. Things like jewelry, different types of makeup, different types of clothing, more elaborate clothing, more elaborately um, painted kind of uh, figurines and that sort of thing. Just to say, hey, I have this and you don't. Um, we can kind of think about it as uh, one, one example I give to, to the students is, you know, driving a Lamborghini in Korea you know, in, in in any Korean city, driving a Lamborghini, there's no there's no point. 
you know, you can't go fast, you're stuck in traffic constantly, but you do it just because of that one second moment when you pull up to a place and there's other people saying, wow, a Lambo, you get out, you take off your glasses, you shut your door and you kind of lean against it for a second and everyone's like, oh, wow, that person's got a lot of money. Okay, it's totally non-essential. We really do not need it. Um, this concept of having this like excessive thing did not start recently. This was definitely started pretty much as early as, as civilization started. Um, right, they bastardized history. Oh, sure, sure, absolutely. Um, the course religion was sustained by a food bank. Right, right. Um, but it's not the religion that was sustained by a food bank. This was like the, the cities. Um, you could kind of think about it as uh, like a food bank for the people. And this is just where they stored it. Everyone knew where to go if we are running into a famine situation um, or something of that nature. This is where the excess was. Um, excess allowed specialization and specialization furthered excess. Absolutely. Um, like Lee driving a Rolls Royce Wraith in Gun Gangnam. It's used to show wealth. Yeah, exactly. Me and my little electric scooter is more like it. I don't, I don't want to drive in Korea. <laughs> it's just too stressful. This is a really beautiful piece of uh, jewelry that they found. Um, there's also another piece of jewelry I was thinking about buying, which is this really cool ring. It is an artifact, um, but I'm not 100% sure. I don't know if it's going to show it. Uh, there it is. So it's a bronze ring. So very cool. It dates back to 2000 BCE. Um, very cool. So I'm not sure if it's something that I might get just to have in my class. Anyway, this whole concept of purchasing things um, would be like perhaps the start of economics, and this would be our likely start of economics. As we mentioned in the previous lesson, this doesn't mean that people that were hunter-gatherers never traded. It just means that trade was not the primary reason for them to do a thing. So if I encountered another hunter-gatherer group and I happened to have excess, uh, I don't know, flint knives or something, and they happen to have excess dried meats, we could trade them, but I'm not making these knives and they're not drying the meat for the purpose of trade. So we're not thinking about economics in that sense. Um, yes, did trade happen? Sure, um, but it's not the reason we're doing stuff. So that's why at this time we can sit down, make things, um, we can actually start with economics. So it's pretty cool. We're also going to get writing at this time period that comes in the Bronze Age, which is after the Neolithic Age, because we're making bronze stuff. Okay, that's all we got. Um, so the first written language that we really have um, an understanding of, that we have all the evidence for, is going to be cuneiform. Now this doesn't mean that other written languages never existed, it just means we haven't found them right now. If we find them later on, cool, gotta update my PowerPoint. But for the time being, it's cuneiform. Um, so this is based on the Sumerian language, and that was in Mesopotamia. Just want to see if you guys wanted to mention something here. Um, that does look very nice. I know it does, doesn't it? Uh, religion and government kind of work together for a common cause or good. Um, I Yes, I would agree with that for sure. Um, religion, and go religion and government were working together. They were the same thing. I... I would say they were slightly different just because the government could be like the physical goings on day to day, whereas religion might be a cycle of things to address celestial happenings or weather patterns or something like that. Um, the government is going to be concerned with things like uh, certain taxes perhaps or working for the leader or being a soldier something like that to protect us for our day-to-day -day life whereas the religious stuff was more like to ensure that we have a good harvest or to ask the rains to come or something like that um, so I think they they're very closely tied together but they also still had their distinctions um, among them for sure um, Hunter-gatherer did not have common currency, so it was a value exchange, not economics. Right. Um, we do get into currency a little bit later, just to, to just let you know. So a lot of this was still um, a trade type of system. The bald guy with the left index finger raised because he was about to strike that kid. Even then you had disciplinarians. Absolutely. 
Um, you may be able interested in the Hongshan culture that predates Chinese culture. I would like to include them. Um, the problem with teaching history is that I have to be on a curriculum. And unfortunately, we're not able to keep adding stuff in. I will say, though, I did have to add in Australia. The entire textbook didn't mention Australia. I was really shocked. I contacted the uh, textbook um, makers. They didn't say anything. So this entire like region with the oldest continuous culture and it, it, it wasn't mentioned ever, um, except for something like when Europeans showed up. And then that was it. That that was like it. You know, we didn't get any any mention of it after that. It was kind of just very strange. Um, not even like modern day history. Just just wasn't mentioned in there. Um, let's see. This reminds me of the Zodiac Killer's Cryptic three forty cipher. Oh, it was solved two weeks ago. Well, thank you. Can you maybe post about that in the um, Discord? That would be very cool. Um, cuneiform in some hybrid is still used by cops today. Um, in Egypt, it's very secretive and underground. I believe it. Maybe Coptic Gnostics, perhaps? Uh, the next writing system we have after this, um, that of course we have the most evidence for, would be hieroglyphics. Okay. And then art. I really like this hair. Isn't this great? Nice curly beards. Fantastic. There's that ring. <laughs> so art comes in a lot of forms. Um, of course, it can be jewelry, it can be painting. And as we talked about um, in the last lesson, art predates civilization as well. So these are the Lascaux paintings um, in the cave in the Lascaux cave in France. So I might be mispronouncing that word. I didn't take French. Um, some of these paintings uh, in Australia by the Aboriginal people are about 40,000 years old or older, which is pretty cool. Um, and this is from Nigeria. So this is a uh, prehistoric Nigerian um, cave art, which is also really cool. So what's the big difference now? Now we're going to be making big pieces of art, okay? We're making, um, not only are we making buildings, which could be argued as an art form, but we're putting art on the buildings. So that's one big thing we weren't able to do as hunter-gatherers. Um, this is an incense burner from Bronze Age Vietnam. This is not something we're going to carry around with us as hunter-gatherers. Um, this is a statue uh, from Mesopotamia. It's of a prince um, that has like flowing water coming out of this uh, this jug here. And there's some pretty interesting details on it. Um, so this is about 4,000 years old. Pretty cool stuff. So the Sumerians make the first writing system. And the way they do that is with something called a stylus. It's usually with a stylus reed and some clay. They also had a type of printing, which is pretty cool. This is one example, and here's another one. Um, printing, we want to have as like a seal. This could be a royal seal that I would start um, or end a document with. Or we could even have um, like a, if I'm a, a merchant and I'm trying to keep track of the same types of items every week, then I would have those items on one of these carved uh, rolling printers so that way it's like we roll it down and it'll say like bushels of wheat apples whatever and then I could just kind of mark how many I have um, or if I'm making any kind of contracts with people on a regular basis I would have something like that too I think that's so cool that they just had that not only are they doing something but they're also creating a time-saving way to do it I think that was just so so cool so human um, so sovereign soul yours was held for review because there is a swear word in there please please make sure um to clean that up um, i will clean that up when i read it um, but please make sure to clean that up for um you know we want to make this student friendly so this is friendly for minors okay um that guy is made of basalt it uh it was a pain in the butt for the artisan to make that dude and all the intricate work absolutely um let's see i wonder if that prince was known for his largesse or something along those lines. Um, yeah, I'm not 100% sure on this particular dude. Um, my idea about it, just looking at it, would be something like he would be maybe revered as a god of the waters or someone to heal something or something with like purification. Um, that's, that's why he would have this outflowing of water. That's my guess. Um, Let's see what else you guys have mentioned. My printer ink dries up if I don't use it for a long time. Probably a problem for clay too. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Stuff that we're also going to get out of um, this region is the wagon wheel, the sundial, bronze, which is copper plus tin, which, I mean, look at this thing. Super cool. We got the ear hole and everything. I love it. Astronomy, that's where we're really going to start with astronomy. This is an ancient Sumerian star map. If you guys want to get into ancient aliens, you sure can. Um, and there's also a number system that uses a base 60. Uh, we've used this today with time, but you can see here just how these were counted. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And we're not using the thumb, so it's 12. And then we'd have 12, 24, 36, 48, 60. So kind of cool. That is the end of our PowerPoint. I also really have to use the bathroom, so I'm going to head out. If you guys have any follow-up questions um, or comments that you want to put, please go ahead and just wait for this video to finish loading, and then you can put that in the comments section. But like I said, I really have to go to the bathroom, so that's what I'm going to do. I will see you guys later, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, and after all of this, I'm going to go ahead and put up like a quick overview, so hopefully that'll be a little bit faster for any students that are just trying to study or cram study or review study um, very quickly. All right, guys, I will see you later. Have a good day.